Jo. When I saw you, my lady, Jo. Una mama, bueno, Jo. When I saw you, my lady, Jo. When I saw you, my lady, Jo. When I saw you, my lady, Jo. Una mama, when I saw you, when I saw you, molded Pedro. You can't me or feel you, but to a memoria, not to a pele. You can't to me, my amiga, but to a imaginação no teu coração. You can't to me as amigos e amigas, para ampliar os caminhos do nosso futuro. I sing, my daughter, to touch the intelligence in your skin. I sing, my son, to open the imagination in your heart. I sing, my friends, to widen the paths into our future. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm not a timekeeper. I'm a pedagogue and an artist, and I've been asked to frame this essential forum with questions. But before I present questions, I would like to congratulate the Heinrich Boll Foundation for this initiative. But above all, I want to congratulate the people who have organized, who had the courage to launch an experimental process over the last two days, bringing artists from all over the world to share their stories, and then bringing cultural activists, theoreticians, practitioners, and teachers to dialogue with those artists. The courage to perform a new paradigm is essential, as this image created by young people from, well, from where? As this image shows, our questions today need to include how to create time, how to open space, or putting it in the words of the music that I sang, how to decolonize memory and decolonize the imagination. We need to congratulate the organizers but we also need to pose questions to them. For instance, the pamphlet that we have in our hands is concerned that we do not instrumentalize art. But the word role in the title of this plenary implies a potential instrumentalization. But it also implies a performance awareness of what we might call a performance literacy. How to develop that reflexive performance that transforms our understanding of the arts from a romantic one, they are languages of expression, into a recognition that these human languages are languages of reflection, of analysis, and of transformation. We need to question the perhaps still dominant, logocentric, and dare I say, Eurocentric paradigm that thinks about the mind and the body, even as linked, but as separate. It's not the obvious fact that the body doesn't just transform the head, or doesn't just transport the head. It's the less obvious fact understood in Latin America, Africa, and most parts of Asia, that the body contains intelligences, and that most people and most continents think with the body. It involves questions about the gender of aesthetics or whether aesthetics is gendered. It requires us to think that we are already on the threshold between two paradigms, a paradigm that's obviously not only in crisis, but cannot recover its own sense of balance. 
and the paradigm that is emerging. This is where I live and work. This is the Amazon. But it's more than the Amazon. It's a place where forests spontaneously come ablaze, where you can pass for 40 minutes over flaming forests looking at the end of the world. It's also a theatre made up of trees in which young people rehearse their transformation and where teachers are educated to think about the arts as essential pedagogical languages. And now yourselves. We're seated with so many experts and expertise in this room. But we need to transform time and space in our performance of a new paradigm of symposiums, of ways in which people gather and exchange knowledges. So I invite you all to turn to the person beside you. Let's begin with you. And then we will find three other people willing to share their knowledges with you. Please turn to the person beside you and chat just a little, what we call in Brazil a dialogic whisper, <laughs> impossible to interrupt once it begins. <laughs> what do you see? You see people turn, people turn to one another and... Excuse me, everyone. Excuse me, everyone. Can I... I can tell you that the sounds, the music of a dialogic whisper is so attractive that you don't want to intervene. But can I ask you to exchange just over a couple of minutes what you see in this mural created out of a collaboration between the North and the South through drama, dance, music and visual arts. What you see and where you see yourself. Two minutes for you and then I will intervene to take care of the time that we have together. Please take this time. What do you see here? Panelists, you're welcome to join. Okay, everyone. Excuse me, everyone. In any way you wish, please thank the person beside you who has just exchanged their knowledge with you. In any way you wish, please thank them. Okay. These images are taken from the Occupy camp in Frankfurt. They show, in my understanding aesthetic poverty. They show an oppositional aesthetic. What 
are the ways in which we can use the human languages, mystified as the arts, to create a global culture that recognizes difference and diversity. How will we evaluate, learn and teach an aesthetics that places equal value to process and artistic production as the production of knowledge and transformation. 1,000 young people in Brazil create a collective signature to then dance a new flag for Brazil. They are learning through dance, they are learning through theatre. They are thinking and creating without words. They are analysing and transforming through other languages presently marginalised in school. And finally, we live in a new paradigm that we don't recognise. It's a paradigm of cooperation and sustainability. But it's not yet visible in most institutions. And it's most institutions that speak to us in public space. These are the military police of Brazil using dance, using drama, using popular culture to create living communities of transformation within the police so that they can create a new police force that is able to perform solidarity, care, dialogue, support and the building of communities of affinity and choice. Please welcome our first speaker, who I'm going to introduce, sitting together. You have in the program a biography of each person. To protect time, I'm going to introduce David as a new friend as a practitioner, and as a great theoretician with a history that I admire deeply. David, the time is yours. Everybody, we have 10 minutes for each speaker. I'm going to pick up this musical instrument. David, the name of this instrument? Marimba. And when they have two minutes to go, I'm just going to pluck a few notes from this finger piano from Afro- Afro-Brazilian culture to indicate we need to start moving towards dialogue with yourselves. After David's speech, we will move back to you to once again build a dialogic space, and then we will hear two other speakers before we return to you to open the conversation in a plenary space which we have rehearsed. David. Thank you, Dan. Is this working? Yeah. It's good. Um, thank you, the people of the Heinrich Boll Foundation. And good afternoon, everyone. It's um, a great honour to be here. Um, I will use my notes, I'm afraid, otherwise you would be here for two hours. It's the only way I can control myself. The architect, Christopher Alexander, writes, What is the single best thing I can do now, at this moment, to bring the whole to life? Maybe it's to offer a poem. So, to heal the whole, healing is believing. See within the whole. And in the meantime, in the space of human choice, paradox conceived. Techno sapiens and hothouse bastard bankers, the Minotaur roams. Icons of our dreams, twixt travellers and merchants, labyrinth of mind between dignity birth of new reality indeterminate born of disorder an unspeakable moment a matter of chance not everyone sees the world as I see the world that's a good thing but I suggest that there are areas of knowledge and more important 
whole ways of seeing, knowing and doing that many of us are denied. As the French philosopher Edgar Morin puts it, the modern pathology of mind is the hyper-simplification that makes us blind to the complexity of reality. We must learn not to be afraid of complexity. The potential for complexity and transdisciplinarity are, I argue, not just questions of academic discourse or utopian New Ageism, but essential to our survival as a species. And if you want to achieve something, you may need to consider the opposite. We humans, particularly those in developed Western societies, are driven by deterministic desires and aspirations to achieve. In this sense, other terms like progress, growth, prosper and development join control, success and power. And these support the myth that to achieve is to survive. However, as Don, Donella Meadows pointed out, magical leverage points are not easily accessible, even if we know where they are and which direction to push them. You may have to work at it, whether that means rigorously casting off all your own paradigms and throwing yourself into the humility of not knowing. In the end, it seems that power has less to do with pushing leverage points than it does with strategically, profoundly, madly letting go. We must learn not to be afraid of transdisciplinarity. However, resolving the will to achieve is not to dismiss this action completely, but to understand that our own society greatly overestimates this masculine or yang property over a feminine or yin approach. As in the tai jitu, yin and yang symbol, seemingly opposite qualities contain elements of the other, and each is totally interdependent on the other for its existence. Indeed, their dynamic equilibrium drives the dance of creation and destruction. Life. The opposite of push may not be pull, but to create a vacuum. Creating a vacuum may also be thought of as making space or taking time into which we are drawn. In other words, allowing something to happen rather than trying to make something happen. Creating the conditions or habitat for living. This path of achievement is much closer to the idea of emergence. It is then the act or the art of making the process manifest that concerns us here, rather than aims. Understanding this epistemology opens up the purpose or the potential for sustainability. And rather than trying to achieve something or solve a problem, it allows us to question the issue. Indeed, the futility of our aims becomes apparent when we see the ecology of the situation, or as Edgar Moran puts it, the ecology in action. If you want to achieve something, in this case, sustainability, first consider the opposite. Then question, what is sustainability? What is it for? How may it help us? What may the consequences be? How may it emerge? The opposite of sustainability may not be collapse, but capable futures. And again, emergence or the evolution of one complex system from another leads us to the concept of transdisciplinarity. But transdisciplinarity demands other conditions. In particular, 
the action of the included middle or the understanding that multiple realities exist simultaneously. This might liberate our thinking and take us away from binary op opposites. As with the concept of yin and yang, the conflict between opposites is also complementary. The Romanian physicist Vasarab Nicolescu writes, The transdisciplinarity vision is resolutely open insofar as it goes beyond all the fields of the exact sciences and demands their dialogue and their reconciliation with humanities and social sciences, as well as with art, literature, and spiritual experience. We must learn not to be afraid of ecology. Much of our culture has been appropriated by the language of economics, in particular, the idea of ecosystem services and products. And sustainability has become synonymous with viability. So it is perhaps time to reinvent our meaning and values of sustainability. A popular desire in market economics is growth economy. So a potential shift in thinking to a fundamental sustainable culture could be growth ecology. Growth ecology may even suggest a proliferation of economic systems as growth economy only refers to the capitalist, monetarist market economics and a monoculture in a denial of ecology. However, ecology, growth ecology, evokes evolutionary diversity, a principle of whole systems ecology that I would argue supersedes sustainability or displays properties that emerge from sustainability to another level of capable futures. So, to conclude, a poem. For the time being, transformative memory all in a lifetime. Forms of settlement, another reality, diverse forests. A flower waiting, rain in a future desert, knowing when to bloom. We must learn not to be afraid of art. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for a very wise and lucid contribution. Thank you. We now turn to you once again and invite you to turn to the person beside you. What are you thinking? Please share just two or three minutes to share your reflections with the person beside you. Okay, everyone. 
Excuse me, please. I have the challenge of another pedagogical intervention asking you to now direct your focused and concentrated gaze to create the performance on stage. I'm really glad to introduce to you a new friend, uh, Pooja Sood from India. I just whispered to her, what does K-H-O-J mean, which you'll find in the program? Pooja, this means to search and to find, to search and to find. Please, in English, in Hindi, but this is a Hindi word, yes. Please welcome Pooja, our second speaker. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for having me here. I'd like to thank the Hendrik Bosch uh, Foundation. Um, I come to this forum with a certain sense of trepidation because I really can't, cannot propose to articulate the role of art for a global environmental cultural change. I come as a practitioner, uh, a curator who has over the last four to five years worked very much with local artists who are struggling to find answers, to find questions, to really ask very hard questions about their local realities. They're trying to find strategies of intervention, of social engagement, activism, maybe none of them, and often feel very frustrated and helpless in the this, in this sudden sea of change and can do nothing more than just present something that seems to be very insidious and under, underground. What I'm going to do is just share a few projects that I have worked with over the last four or five years and um, ask a few questions at the end of this about art and sustainability or development or, of, you know, developing sustainability. <laughs> um, fact or fiction? This is, an uh, this is an art project done by an artist called, uh, in India called Krishna Chonat during a, a large uh, public art festival that we put together, actually supported and commissioned by the Goethe Institute and the GTZ in Delhi, called 48 Degrees Public Art Ecology. And this is a crane holding a dead tree. It created a havoc on the streets. This was placed very strategically next to the metro station, the icon of Delhi today, which definitely gets a huge number of people off the streets and is valuable in terms of developing India and developing Delhi. But what is not seen is that about 200 to 300 trees were ripped off, almost 300 years old, beautiful old trees, which supported um, shoeshine boys, uh, minor, small, uh, small um, economies of food and uh, cigarette sellers under the shade of that tree. They were just wiped out sometime at night. And this kind of came in, in view of people and created a huge conversation which was then built in by another artist, as you can see. Um, this is a project done by Ravi Agarwal, who is an environmentalist but also an artist. And from, this was done during a Khoj residency in 2007, well before the Commonwealth Games that was going to pretty much change the stage and change the, the nature of the city of Delhi. This is called, have you seen the flowers on the river? This project, um, you know, is talked, examined the self-sustaining microeconomies that underpin the Mari gold fields on the river Yamuna, which have existed in Delhi for over 200 years, where the river is still clean. Here it is unmarred by the sewage, left to flow by the city, which does not realize where, it is drinking, where its drinking water comes from. The river, the river bank has rich, fertile sto soil, washed down from the Himalayas by each year's floods. Farming families have for long cultivated hundreds of acres of marigolds here without pesticides or fertilizers. When the artists went there and spent over a month just talking to them, figuring out what was happening. And for those of you who know India, the marigold flower is something that is used every day. It goes into the temples for death rituals, for, life, for, for, for weddings, um, it, it's for garlands, for the politicians and Hollywood stars. It, it is all pervasive. It's one of the most important flowers in India. And his blog records, each acre of land is fertile for flowers for seven months of the year, from October to April. The flowers are grown and plucked by family and relatives and sold mostly in the Fatapur uh, Mandi, which is a farmer's market down the road. 
Often they land up back in the river as decaying garbage, a sustainable use of land and a sustainable livelihood alongside a clean and healthy environment. The government, however, is acquiring thousands of acres of fertile land by the riverbed from the farmers to build concrete stadiums, temples and a Commonwealth Games village. Deeply disruptive, the farmers and the villagers have lost a sustainable livelihood while the city loses its flowers. Another river. This is one in the hills of, of, um, of the Himalayas. It's in Badrinath. Um, Badrinath is one of the four main shrines for Hindus. This was two artists who hailed from Badrinath. And over the years, they have, you know, it's, it's six, for six months in the year, it's snowbound. So nobody goes there. And it's become very much a tourist destination. And as you can understand, tourism with all its paraphernalia has almost killed the ecology of a very pristine place. The artists went up there and discovered that what was really being carried, it's holy water in, you know, that people are supposed to get from this river, the Ganges the early part of the Ganges, and discovered that they were carrying plastic bottles, etc. And they went and found several springs that were giving fabulous portable water and created a lot of the signage, which is their creation, with a, with, um, which was called Badri Jal Abhyan, which means Amrit, which is also a nectar, and created a whole strategy for people, for visitors, for pilgrims, to actually navigate and find these places instead of buying bottled water, which then ends up as trash. And they did this over a period of time, brought on... It was a whole process of negotiating with the temple authorities, of getting spaces there. That was the project. Activism? Perhaps. Um, this is another... Um, this is the Jakur Lake in Bangalore. Another, an artist has been there, who lives very close to this place, a natural lake, which really has the most beautiful economies where people wash their clothes, they do fishing in certain parts of the year. But of course, the, um, the Bangalore Development Authorities speak a language of development of the lake, preserving it from pollution, increasing the storage capacity, saving the land from real estate encroachers, and also preparing for an articulated public utility. To fulfill these requirements, walking pathways, islands for migratory birds, boat jetty, and in their wisdom, they have removed, dewatered this natural lake, killing fish, which were actually splattered all over the roads and making it a new, um, you know, man-made lake, absolutely killing the ecology of the place. This is another, um, this is Restless in Sikkim, which is the northeast of India. Sikkim in the northeast Himalayan region is currently witness to a spate of hydroelectric projects. Hold your breath, everyone. 27 existing ongoing project, uh, proposed projects in the Tista River Basin. As a consequence, the physical and social landscape of this small mountainous state is being dramatically altered. As part of the negotiating routes, which was a project that Koj has, has curated to allow artists in different parts of India to kind, to, um, to kind of understand and work with local communities in areas that bother them. Um, the artists traveled across northern Sikkim trying to understand this changing ecology through conversations and photographs. Through their interactions, they reported on how they were struck by the underlying sense of anxiety and unease around these dams. Most conversations were ambivalent. Most points of views unfixed. On the one hand, there was, a sense, there was a sense of loss and inability to articulate what exactly was happening and how it should be dealt with. On the other hand, there were opportunities everyone was trying to make the best of. The work came together in the planting of a silver fir tree from the now denuded river basin in a solitary monastery in Gangtok, which is the capital of northern Sikkim, as also Restless, a text image catalogue of the artist's impressions of the places they visited and the phenomena they experienced. And finally, I'd like to talk about a project which really deeply affected me personally. This is by the artist Amar Kanwar, and again, this was part of the 48 Degrees project. The, uh, we were trying to get artists to look at sites that meant something to them. And he chose, as he has been an activist for many years, in a very silent, poetic way, the site in Delhi called Jantar Mantar, which is a site of protest. And over there, there is a triangle uh, a beautiful triangle which has one solitary people tree, which he called the Sovereign Forest. What he did, one day, and I quote from his artist note because it's just beautifully written, 
One day in 2008, during an extended winter session of the parliament, a long banner wound its way along the railing of Jantar Mantar, along the footpaths that run through the space designated for public protest by the Delhi police. It stated, they created an image that was meant to lie. They then created another image to convince me about the truth of that lie. They obliterated every dream I had, my home, my love, my family, my land, my trees, my river. They annihilated every sign of my ancestors. They disregarded every plea and discredited my anger. Is there an image for the hope that still lies in my heart? Is there an image for the fear that refuses to leave their heart? At the far end of the banner was a film that travelled across time within different ecological and political resistances in India. And opposite it, 46,910 inches northwest of the Indian Parliament, a beautiful tree from the sovereign forest made itself visible in the centre of a triangular island in the middle of a traffic and repeated a question. A question presented with all respect for the consideration of the Honourable Speaker and members of the Indian Parliament. The question paved the edges of the island. If you wanted to read the question, you had to go around the tree. Images appeared and danced like leaves in the tree. Their shadows threw a beautiful pattern on the floor. Six craftsmen from Bastar forests, which is the tribal area, and where mining, you know, the tribals are being thrown off because of the mining there, had made a railing around the tree using traditional iron melting techniques. Many people came, some talked for hours, while several sat down quietly under the tree and stayed for a while. During the entire winter session, the tree and the island on which it stood, bordered by the soft light of the question, welcomed it, welcomed all as it became a place of calm. What is that question? Recently I met a man, Nidhan was his name. He lived in a village that had been home to his ancestors for generations. Beautiful streams emerged from all around. People said the water came from somewhere deep inside the hills because the hills were special. His village was on the slope of a hill within which it was said were hidden 173 million tons of bauxite ore. One day, the Democratic Government of India sold all the hills to bauxite mining and aluminium companies from across the world. I asked him, in the forest by the hill, under a tree, on the grass, by the stream, under the sky. Nidhan, the Indian nation needs the bauxite. Why do you resist the mining of bauxite? Is not the good of our nation more important than the future of a few old villages? He looked me in the eye, expressionless, and picked up his knife that lay on the ground and said, Do you see this knife? With this, I can cut the grass. How would you describe that action? Would you describe it as an act of cutting? And if you take the same knife and cut my throat, how would you then describe that action? Again, you could describe it as cutting, like a verb. The knife cut there, the knife cut here. Now, can you explain to me the difference between these two cuttings? If you can explain to me the difference between cutting grass and cutting my throat, I will tell you the difference between the good of the nation and the good of our villages. And I think that this is the question that underlies several of these, of our... Um, of what is happening in India, across India, in the name of development. And I think the question coming up is, what is development? What is sustainable development? Whose good is it for? Who's, who is it for? With that, I leave it. Questions? Pooja, thank you very much for rooting global questions in local examples. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I now have the great pleasure of welcoming an even newer friend, because we drank wine together last night and exchanged stories. But Gianluca, we are just getting to know. Um, Gianluca is Professor of Philosophy of Science and Epistemology and of Human Sciences at the University of Bergamo in Italy. And we are meeting him for the first time. Gianluca, the floor is yours. All right. Uh, uh, please give a welcome to Gianluca. <laughs> So, uh, first of all, I want to, to thank you, the organizator, for uh, uh, giving us an impossible task. Uh, because speaking in 10 minutes about sustainability and transdisciplinarity and complexity and art and science, it would be a very impossible task. So we can uh, be very relaxed, because the task is not attaining anything but uh, a conversation in a process. 
And um, I think that uh, this is the spirit of transdisciplinarity. For instance, uh, I was very happy because David uh, quoted Edgar Morin, because I am a, a, a good, uh, if you want, uh, disciple or, or friend of Edgar Morin, that uh, by now is uh, 90. And I think that his whole career is a, a showing how uh, to uh, uh, do transdisciplinarity, not as a theorizing, but as an experience. Because Edgar Morin um, was and is a social scientist, uh, that in a, a even a, a political leftist oriented, then in the 50s and in the 60s, realized that uh, in order to understand uh, human science and social science, we have to know what the man is. So he uh, had a very broadened um, watch uh, to the human experience, and he studied a lot, wrote a lot about the process of becoming a human human evolution. It was uh, very instrumental in founding uh, um, uh, ant evolutionary anthropology, or if you want, global anthropology, with uh, uh, a connection between the roots of mankind and the present and the future. Then uh, Edgar Morin wanted to know uh, how uh, the man is embedded in the life which is the logic of life. And so I uh, wrote a lot about uh, the power of life, the generative power of life, and so on. And by now, that is uh, in the 90s, is coming back to political perspective, writing a lot about sustainability ecology. And he wrote a book uh, now uh, called The La Voix en France, uh, that uh, should be translated in the other languages, the life, because, uh, of course, he returned to the political problems, but with an experience of traveling around the fields of uh, knowledge. So transdisciplinarity is not a connection of territory, a static connection, I'm here and you are there, but it's a travel, a journey, an experience. And uh, so oh, we are nomads. I think that uh, uh, the field of complexity is a nomadic field, but in which we return. Uh, is not uh, uh, a nomadic in the sense that we like to lose ourselves in the labyrinth. We want to have a map and we want to have the experience of uh, being uh, changed but even to change the territory uh, with, uh, in which uh, we have experience. So the spirit, I think, uh, it's very important because by now, I think that one of the important things about sustainability and art as, as well is, that is science had a growing sense of auto-limitation, as for me. As for me, I, I mean that uh, our world, our modern world, was a uh, scientocentric world because uh, science wanted to be the more uh, future oriented knowledge, and so uh, rigor and a lot of our value are molded by a very narrow view of science that is of objective, that is absolute, very general, very abstract, that uh, bodies uh, don't know but only mind and so on. By now, science has uh, uh, grown uh, the discovery in itself of the limitation of this approach. And so, of course, science is opening to art as a form of knowledge that can teach, that can complete the approach that uh, science cannot develop it in the modernity, and by now I think is compelled to develop. Uh, for instance, uh, I, I, I had only some very broad points that, as for me, are very important, because 
A friend of, uh, of me, uh, a philosopher named Aldo Giorgio Gargani, that uh, uh, died uh, uh, some years ago, and uh, he loved very much Berlin, he spent a lot of time in Berlin, so I like to remind him, uh, said that by now, philosophy and science are changing view from the process of truth to the process of truth. Because truth is not an attainment, but it's a process. The, the, the important thing in knowing is not the goal. It's the experience in which uh, together are embedded in uh, the, the path toward uh, some provisional goal. So science, first of all, by now is contextual. There's, there is not a truth uh, independent on spice, te, time, and the, the uh, impromptu of observer. Or, if you want, there is not uh, thought independent from a civilization, from uh, a spirit of time, from uh, a, a community, even if the community may be very broad, all the world of science, of course. And so... You know, the, the main experience was the, in, in, in the, at the beginning of the uh, uh, 20th century when physicists discovered that, that microcosmos, atom, is quite different from our world. And so if we can speak uh, um, uh, with the cognition about the position of a particle in our world, that's not the same in the small of, of atom. Uh, I remember that uh, the beginning of this path was uh, founded in Wilhelmstrasse by Max Planck in November uh, 19. So uh, Berlin is quite instrumental in the, this path. In any case, uh, by now, it's not only the physicist truth, but even the human truth, because some uh, uh, ideas... That we have the truth in a particular age, by now are no more productive, not because they are false, but because they uh, have exhausted the power of generating novelty. <laughs> That's the problem. A lot of things, a lot of paradigm we have to superstate uh, is not because they were false and now we have on the right page but because uh, in, in the past they were productive, and by now we, we want another sort of generation, because the, our collectivity is oriented by different value. So if uh, the things are like that, uh, I do think that one of the most important contributions of Edgar Morin and the complexity theory to the action is a new idea of planning, because Edgar Morin is quite clear uh, he said that, uh, first of all, we implemented a, an idea of uh, constructing the future as an attainment, a, as a program. We want to arrive there, and so we have to plan in a very narrow manner all the steps. Now, we need an ecology of action that learns from the environment and from people in each step. So the concept of experience, it's quite instrumental because if you want attainment, you have the road without sight uh, on the, the side of the room. You have in, uh, on an uh, autoroute, on a very uh, a road, a uh, motorway without uh, uh, stops. But if you want experience, you are a sort of flaneur. And you have experience in each corner of your life because reality is going to change not only in the magic point of leverage, but in every corner. And so this is, I think, the perspective of uh, art that, uh, of course, sometimes more explicit, sometimes uh, implicit, but artists do believe that each moment of their art is significant for themselves and for the people. It's not only the attainment, but the communication in the process 
of, of constructing a work of art. A work of art is a process, not a result. So I think that uh, there is a lot of things to discuss together, and uh, I thank very much uh, all of you for uh, this uh, sympathetic audience. Thank you. Gianluca, thank you very much. Gracias. Gracias. We can now turn back to you to have a moment to reflect with the person beside you, a moment to think about what you've heard and also to formulate questions together. And in two minutes, I open this conversation as a plenary conversation, which you have rehearsed for. Take these two minutes, please, just to exchange with the knowledge beside you and to identify questions that matter to you. Thank you. And we'll talk over here as well. Gianluca, I can imagine fascinating dialogue between you and ancestral Really fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Can we arrange No, we should arrange it because of the. I think there are. The very good thing of this era that all over the world there is a great a good movement uh, in art, in science. There is a, a network of people that uh, are not knowing uh, they, because the spirit of time is a real thing. So we have to, to, to render this network and all that. Okay, everyone. Excuse me, everybody. In a... Excuse me, everyone. Um, without wanting to re-stimulate a whisper, please thank the person who's been in conversation with you beside you. And in any way you want. In, in Brazil, if you say please thank the person beside you, everyone begins to kiss and to hug and you spend half an hour trying to... So we now have 20 minutes for conversation. And in, I just say that in Latin America, it's very normal as a kind of pedagogy and an aesthetics within symposia to alternate between men and women as questioners or as ref people reflecting so that you really hear a diversity of experiences and a diversity of ways of knowing and ways of thinking. Can I invite anyone who feels ready to offer a, a contribution to the people who've spoken today Depending on how the conversation develops, we may respond, we may just enjoy the richness and diversity of knowledges that exist in the room. So let's begin, first of all, with yourselves. Does anyone want to begin with a question or a reflection on what you've heard? I think there's a microphone coming, and I think... 
Yeah. We have a... Yeah. Um, so my name is Heike, coming from Germany. Thank you very much for this inspiring session, and thank you for keeping the time. So uh, we were just discussing with each other about your images and pictures about this gross ecology or ecology of growth. So keeping it or taking your thoughts of not planning, but letting it happen and um, making a vacuum to erase uh, the new world. So how does it vacuum look like for you? Do you have already some pictures, ideas? So this would be really interesting. Thanks. Thank you. If it's all right with everyone else, let's take a handful of questions and then see where we stand in relation to the people who've spoken. Does a man want to find? Yeah. Thank you. What's your name? I'm David. Thanks, David. Thank you. I'm, I'm Oleg um, from Copenhagen, working with Kultur 21 Nordic. And um, I've been working over the last couple of days. I've been very happy to work with the, the artists from the Survive Art Project. And one of the things that struck me when I went to see, well, both in the days that we were working together, but also when I went to see their exhibition yesterday, was that many of them... Um, enter directly into a relation and a dialogue with um, aspects of exchange and trade and production, but on a very local and very personal and very intimate level. So that's a reflection, which you can use. Um, and my question, which is maybe a little bit more abstract, is how does changing time change our economy? Thanks very much, Oleg. Can I invite another woman to contribute? Yes. Uh, hello, I am Maria Rosa from Ecuador, and I live in Rome. Um, well, I think that the main thing that I find very interesting is the fact that finally I can place myself into a context uh, because I, on one hand, am a trainer, and I am a, an activist, and I study arts. And sometimes it's really hard to define what you do. And when I listen to Professor Bocchi, when he says, uh, traveling through paths of knowledge, to talk about transdisciplinarity, which has been always a problem that people have been asking to me, uh, I don't know if it gives me answers of what a path could be or work, but at, get, at least it gives me the the idea that I can that I can do more questions on that side of the of the activity, whatever it is that I do. And uh, yeah, this transdisciplinarity is something that I'm really interested in, and how to face it when it comes to. Uh, mm, Making, code, making questions as artists or as social workers or as both of them or as none of them regarding sustainability of our planet and of our um, action. And I would like more of that. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Rosa. Can I take another question? Just before you, ask, or you speak, does any man wish to say anything at this stage? Please. Okay, my name is um, Bing Pei, and I'm an artist and fashion designer from Nigeria. Um, we've heard so much from the different um, presentations, but my bother, and I was sharing with the person sitting next to me, is where do you draw the line for some things that have to be done? We need trees, we need greenery, but at the same time, um, we need housing, we need shelter. So where do you draw um, the line, okay, you should take this kind of three, trees down to um, do this, but plant some other trees back in this place? So it's, it's really, um, like, confusing for me because, okay, we, I mean, we are man. We are supposed to use things, not abuse them. You need furniture for your home. To get furniture, to get other things, you cut trees. To get paper, you use trees. I mean, we can be writing on slates or metal. I don't know. So where do you stop or how do you go about, I mean, I don't know. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. You're asking for people to be very practical as well in terms of responding to human needs. 
Thank you. Um, can I take another question? Yes. Yes, um, my name is Shegwan Defila. I'm from Nigeria. Um, when we saw the first image on the screen that you asked us to look at, um, what bothered me and my next chair neighbor was um, the, the remote control. It was lovely to see that remote control, but again, it looked a bit offensive. You know, somebody's controlling something. And then the idea of control became... Um, an issue for us to engage. And we're wondering, what is wrong with control? And, um, and I told him, well, the obvious way, I mean, I could feel the control, is when you tell us this course with your neighbor, okay, guys, you stop now. Okay, can, you can start again. I mean, um, then we, we started asking, um, so what is the positive control and the negative control? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Can I take another questioner or another person who wants to share a reflection? Yes. Uh, my name is Rania. I come from Jordan. Uh, my question is about the um, concept of uh, development and um, whether you think it's become too problematic as uh, affecting um, our um, thoughts or perception of what it involves and whether we need at this time to move forward to a different uh, terminology and hence um, mindset in terms of understanding development work. Thank you. Thanks very much. I mean, can we take one more uh, question or reflection from the corner over there? And then with your agreement, we can ask the people who provoked us to pick a particular focus where they will respond to you. Is that okay? Yeah, please. Thank you, um, Patricia Kistenmacher, coming from Argentina. And uh, what I would like to, to ask uh, or to listen to any reflection about is um, complexity means this and the other. Interdisciplinarity means this one and the other one. So what would be need as a culture or as a um, human race or as pedagogues or educators to help us transform this uh, um, this attitude of choosing this or the other into this and the other. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone, I'm going to propose that we reverse the sequence now. We ask... Um, Gianluca to begin and if each of you could focus for perhaps two or three minutes um, on what you think is a key question for you in relation to what we've heard from our audience. I think to, to assemble a little bit uh, of uh, intervention uh, because um, mm, uh, some uh, points about uh, uh, the vacuum. Of course, uh, uh, mm, vacuum is not intended that we have uh, uh, not to do anything, uh, we have to pause. But the problem that uh, we have, uh, uh, we must not to be directive. But uh, uh, if you want uh, to have other people grown, to help other people in empowering themselves, of, if not people, spaces, and so on. Uh, because there is a lot of uh, literature about creative groups. And of course, a discovery is, is that creativity is not 
individual, but collective property because uh, all of, uh, even for an educational point of view, all of us uh, uh, know that uh, there is uh, people very creative that uh, are very suffering in some environment, in, the, in other environment they uh, do the best. Uh, because of the attitude of the, if you want, the leader, the manager, the director, because there is an, an instructive attitude, we have to do, uh, to behave like this, and the uh, helping attitude. So I think that uh, make the vacuum uh, does signify let the relationship grow, let People understand the other, uh, give spa space and time to occasion of the relationship. And so there is another very related question, the question of time in our models of economy or ecology. Because, of course, time is a, power, uh, a powerful force of generating uh, the novel. But time... Uh, uh, is uh, uh, an opportunity for a relationship to grow. So time is never enough. We have uh, the slowness, we have to discover the slowness. Fast uh, sometimes is not uh, the, the right uh, way to behave. Because we have an example in biology. Evolution uh, is, uh, uh, is a, a, a so powerful force because life has a lot of time. We are here for, because we are here in three milliard years of evolution, of a relationship between bacteria, animals and plants and so on. And even in the cells in the genome, there is a lot of parts that have a very long history of cooperation. So if you want to have a sustainability uh, society, a sustainability relation, uh, we need a more connected society. Non by homogenization, but by dialogue, and by the time of uh, discovering each other. So the, the question about uh, the education is central because we need time of narrate each other. For instance, uh, there is very dramatic experience in Europe, in Middle East, uh, of course, uh, uh, Serbian and Croatian, Serbian and Albanian, or uh, even Palestinian and Israeli and so on. Of course, uh, if you want that young people can cooperate, they have to narrate themselves the, the history of the, the parents of the, the ancient and the, the respective representation. Otherwise, uh, sometimes uh, it's all okay, but next time another fight. The problem of Yugoslavia, for instance, when uh, the Second World War uh, was out, they never spoke about the war, never spoke about the different representation between Serbian and Croatian, and uh, all broke uh, out. By now, we do hope that sp speaking about different narrative uh, and uh, historical roots, uh, we can have a broader space of understanding each other. So I think that uh, the education to the other is a very instrumental way to open the way of a mental sustainability. Because, of course, if we have not mental sustainability, we cannot cooperate to ecological problems, of course. Gianluca, thank you very much. Thank you. This is tough. Large questions in limited time. Pooja, what are you thinking? Well, I'm just throwing the question. Yeah, it'll, they'll do it. I think I'm, I'm thinking about the very question I put forward, which was about the, the meaning or the twin-edged sword of, of development 
in our part of the world and where you know what is that edge between development where you can slip to one side and at the cost of what when you're looking at environment and really there are no straightforward answers there are you know i don't know how to answer that i wish we did and i think which is um i think artists are grappling as as is all the rest of the world while governments are tending to look at development in economic terms and that's where we're losing out because they don't seem to be on human terms at all and um i don't know whether that sounds simplistic but i do know that every time you're confronted with a what about this and what about that it's 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 the cacophony of just many positions and you've got to figure out where you where you need to be and then hold there really thank you pooja david what's on your mind <laughs> okay <laughs> um I'd just like to start with the, the, somebody brought up a question i think a lady at the back um about interdisciplinarity um it's my understanding that in fact um transdisciplinarity is neither interdisciplinarity nor multidisciplinarity it actually refers to a process that is between the dis- disciplines across disciplines and beyond all disciplines in other words it creates another place another reality and that space i think is what is important so when we're looking at um this idea of vacuum it is this emergent place this emergent space this emergent time that we might want to consider so making time a matter of urgency i think is a very important way of thinking and in terms of the link between time and economics in many of my projects a question that i pose to the people i'm working in is how long is a long term investment i work with the forestry commission in the uk who are bound by uh, european diktats and they work as a long term project over 5 to 10 years so i ask how long does it take to grow a forest in a temperate climate i suggest between 3 and 500 years that is a long term project that is a long term investment 5 to 10 years is meaningless in the lifetime of a forest in this way we might actually be able to change the knowledge that we have in such matters so that knowledge becomes a dynamic flow rather than a silo of knowledge that's retained by institutions so finally the idea of um control and power um control doesn't ne- necessarily mean the abuse of power but unfortunately that happens all too often and in terms of drawing the line um between one kind of action and another kind of action um i think you actually ended by answering your own question when it went from what is the line to how do we live and there's a line from uh the leech gatherer poem by william wordsworth uh which is how do you live and what is it that you do and this is a greeting from where i live in the north of england thank you very much david everyone can i ask you to thank three very different speakers for sharing their knowledge with us thank you can i also thank you can i also draw your attention or not so much draw your attention because i think you already know but celebrate the decision by the heinrich boll foundation to publish two really stimulating essays as part of this contribution which is a world debate as you know it's not just in terms of rio plus 20 but 
There are networks throughout the world where artists and cultural activists and, and people who are developing projects and curators are working side by side with politicians and teachers. I don't know whether you know that in Medellin, Colombia, they dedicated 5% of the budget of the city to culture. And in that way, we're able to transform conflict between drug cartels and paramilitary organizations by young people, not only empowering themselves, but also attracting other young people to work with them through different kinds of cultural processes, which didn't industrialize their creativity, but transform their city. So there are examples, there are examples inside Latin America, but also inside Africa, where culture is already a social and transformative force linked to preservational aesthetics and ancestral wisdoms. And I think that the forums that take place over the next day and a half and the workshops will give us much more opportunity to think together. And finally, I want to celebrate with you um, the work of artists who are present and have taken the risk not just to speak here, but also to publish their work and to present it. You can find their work in this catalogue. Let's thank the artists and yourselves for speaking in English, listening in English and participating. Please go to the exhibition and have a good day. Thank you. And I have um, the technician Falk over there. Who's, uh, Falk, would you give us some music as we leave the exhibition? <laughs>